Hey folks, this is Abel James, and thanks so much for joining us on the Fat Burning Man Show, where we talk about real food, real results, and sometimes just how not to die. So even before the entire world shut down, worldwide, 80% of kids today don't exercise enough. And the physical activity guidelines are quite minimal, no matter where you're looking. So what do you think these numbers look like today or for grown-ups? It's abysmal, but we all need to move more than ever. And if you can't, um, and, and there are a lot of situations where people are not allowed to move, maybe that's good for a short amount of, of time uh, for various reasons, but we need to fight for our right <laughs> for recess, even if we're adults, no matter what country we're in, it seems. So physical play and getting outdoors was something that came naturally to us when we were kids. But as life steams ahead, it seems more and more kids and adults alike, we need to be encouraged or find some sort of excuse uh, to allow yourself time to enjoy natural movements of your bodies. And also, there's a lot of shame that's built up around our bodies and, and being judged for how we move or how we exercise, and that can prevent a lot of people from ever doing it in the first place. So if, if that's you, then know that you're being robbed of something that is so important and your natural birthright, which is, you know, to be able to move through the world in your own way. And and so many of us are hobbled or, or crippled or just moving in ways that are completely unnatural. And one that <laughs> comes to mind is, is thinking of, about how Joaquin Phoenix in the Joker moves just kind of distorted and grotesque. And if you watch people, you know, just getting out of their cars these days, you can see that. And that's because we're not using our bodies the way that they should be when, you know, when we're hanging from trees or running up mountains or even doing things just like getting outside in the fresh air with some sun with your dog or your significant other. Th these are things that we're not doing enough, most of us. And I can't think of a better person to remind us how important it is to go outside and play than our friend Daryl Edwards. Daryl has a fascinating story of being a former investment banking technologist turned movement coach, author, researcher, and creator of the Primal Play Method. He's also a talented musician as well, which I think is part of this whole thing. I really do. Being a creator, some sort of artist, whether that be visual art, theater, performance of, of any kind, but certainly music and, and play, these are all very very related to each other and building one of these modalities can help build the others i believe on today's show with daryl we're talking about how you can put the fun into functional fitness you see what he did there <laughs> we're going to talk about how not to get steamrolled by life and tons more but before we get there i wanted to share a note that came in that really touched my heart this one's from brad and he says Abel, I recently discovered your podcast. It is great. I love it. I plan to go back through and listen to all of them. Now, as the entire world is in panic over this pandemic, it is great to have a resource like the Fat Burning Man podcast. I want to share some of my story. I grew up in Virginia, but I've been living in East Africa for almost 20 years because of my work. I direct a small nonprofit that does humanitarian and community projects in some conflict zones here. About seven years ago, I lost my father to complications from type 2 diabetes, which led to a slew of other lifestyle-related health issues. My dad was a great father and still my hero. Dad was so great in so many areas, but not in the area of self-care. I watched him suffer unnecessarily and die at the young age of 72. Uh, that put me on a journey to rediscover my own health. As a father of four great children, ages 18 to 23, I want to be available and healthy to enjoy my time with them going forward for as many years as God may give me. In 2018, as I approached 50, I decided to rally and battle for my health. I began intermittent fasting. I stopped eating processed food. I eliminated grains. And I stopped eating scavenger animals like pork, shellfish, and farm-raised fish and began eating more green vegetables, eliminated a lot of foods that were causing gut and joint inflammation, and changed my sleeping and exercise habits. Having experienced a lot of sport-related injuries, including multiple concussions, dislocated shoulders torn ligaments, 
fractured patella. I used to wake up with back and knee pain and experience headaches. By eating real food, sleeping better, and exercising better, I dropped 50 pounds in about three to four months leading up to my 50th birthday in 2018. No more joint pain or headaches, more energy and mental clarity. Now, as I discover your podcast, I am excited to find another resource to help me stay on the right path of health. I have shared with all my children, friends, and family. Keep up the great work. Best regards, Brad. Wow, Brad, I don't I don't remember reading a note from East Africa before, but there are so many things that you said here. Th- firstly, thank you so much for for writing in, sharing this with your family and and really putting this into action. For those of you listening who think that I'm just babbling on too long or taking too long before the interview, listen to what he said here. I'm just going to go back through it uh, real quick here. He says, uh, as I approached 50, I decided to rally and battle for my health. Number one, that's what you have to do. You need to rally and be ready for a battle because you're going to be attacked. Our health is under attack, whether it's just the people around you making fun of you for drinking a smoothie or eating vegetables in public or whatever, or uh, literally, you know, the powers that be who wants us dependent on them eating GMO nonsense, lab grown, disgusting, profiteered and completely manipulated schlop, Soylent Green. I began intermittent fasting. That is something that's so important more than ever now, especially if you haven't tried it before. Try spending a few hours, especially in, in the morning when you first wake up, push back your first meal a few hours. See how see how you feel after a few days. Or even especially if, if finding enough food is tough, which it is for so many people now, and I feel for you, um, you know, taking one day, out of the week um, to to start building your fat burning mechanisms once again by practicing intermittent fasting can be a very empowering thing to do. And you know, Allison and I, we've done more extended fasts as well. I like doing three day fasts from time to time. Now I wouldn't recommend, you can abuse fasting, obviously. There is a line there and you need to learn where it is, but there's a lot of good stuff that can happen when you start experimenting with intermittent fasting. Um, Okay, so then, He stopped eating processed food, another monster step. Um, If you do have processed food around your house right now, keep it for a rainy day. Put it in the back of the closet in a bag or whatever, because it'll keep for two years anyway. Keep that shelf stable stuff that's that's highly caloric or high in sugar. It's not good for you now. It's not good for your health or your, your immune system will take a hit if you abuse that food. But if you put it away for a bit and you focus on eating as fresh as you can, real foods, nutrient-dense foods, that's going to make a monster difference, a positive difference. Um, he eliminated grains. That kind of goes away you know, with processed foods to some degree, but that's another big win because basically grains are a source of sugar. Yes, they last on the shelf. They can stay a a long time as a source of of food, but it's not optimal food and it's not necessarily nutrient dense, most of those grains. So kicking those out, big win. And then stop, he stopped eating scavenger animals like pork, shellfish, and farm-raised fish. So for a lot of people, that means kicking out farm-raised things from the industrial uh, system. But that can be a big win as well. Kick out the the meats as well that don't work for you, the low-quality meats. Um, then he began eating more green vegetables, eliminated a lot of foods that were causing gut and joint inflammation, and changed my sleeping and exercise habits. Like in that one paragraph, you covered <laughs> everything you need to do. So if you want to, you can just turn this show off right now. You have the answer. Put it into action. But I I do obviously encourage you to listen to the rest of this episode with Daryl because it's so good. But once again, Brad, thank you so much for writing in. You you shared some deep wisdom there. So if you're looking for free resources as a listener, or if you want to read transcripts of this show, which link to scientific studies and other people's web websites and everything in between, go to fatburningman.com. You can find over 300 episodes of this show completely for free without outside sponsors. Now, if you'd like to help support us, though, you can check out our programs over at fatburningman.com in our store. Uh, you can join our 30-day challenge over at fatburningman.com slash 30 days. That's fatburningman.com slash 30 days. And then even better, we just launched something that's that's very exciting because if you only have a few bucks um, to throw in our tip jar, now we have one. 
for you. And we also have coaching that we're going to be offering, group coaching as well as one-on-one virtual coaching with me, which I've never offered before quite like this um, and, and certainly haven't done it in many years since I first started up Fat Burning Man. So if you're interested in the coaching or you just want to you know, help buy me or Allison a coffee or a bone for our dog, go to, who's right behind me for the <laughs> video watchers, fatburningman.com slash tip jar. You can also brand new thing. Look up Abel James or Fat Burning Man on Patreon. We've been censored by YouTube and so many other places that we're having trouble communicating with you and and getting the truth out there as we see it and practicing free speech, which is very important. So one of the ways we're going to continue to do that is uh, and be very annoying to the powers that be is by not giving up and finding new ways to keep in touch with you. So if you have subscribed you know, on, on Facebook, on YouTube, on Instagram, on Twitter, on a lot of these other various places. I've heard of many of you being unsubscribed, you know, without you actually doing it or just never seeing our stuff anymore. So one way that, that you can always get in touch is by going to fatburningman.com as well as looking us up on Patreon. We're starting up Slack and we have the Fat Burning Tribe. So lots of exciting stuff coming your way. Getting your nutrients in right now is something that that our families are prioritizing more than ever. So if you're interested in Wild Superfoods, please go to wildsuperfoods.com. Sign up for the subscribe and save. You'll not only save a bunch of money, but also get free access to our coaching community uh, and recipe library. So go to wildsuperfoods.com and sign up for the subscribe and save, and we'll hook you right up. All right. On to this show with our friend Daryl Edwards. We're chatting about how the phrase I play can transform you, making functional fitness fun again, how to take the superhero path, what not to do and what to do in an emergency situation, how not to get completely steamrolled by life, important right now, and tons more. Let's go hang out with Daryl. All right, folks, returning to the show today, Daryl Edwards is a former investment banking technologist turned movement coach, author, researcher, and creator of the Primal Play Method. It's been a while since we last hung out in person, but last time I saw you, Daryl, I'm pretty sure you were pushing cars uphill, carrying people around on your shoulders and climbing up buildings like Spider-Man. So I'm really glad you're back. Yeah, that sounds that sounds about right. So since I last saw you, I climbed down the building, <laughs> parked the parked the car, uh, and now ready to have a chat. So yeah, <laughs> but you're still at it. So uh, we we're just talking about um, the first time I had you on this show, which I think was 2012, 2013, a, a long time ago. And it's so weird how the world has—I don't want to say evolved since then because that's not the right word, um, but. But things are a bit different now. I'm glad to see that you're still at it, still putting great books out there. You've got your deck now. So just catch us up on on where things are at and, and how we can deal with this crazy world. I thought it was getting better for a minute. Now it, I'm not for sure. Yeah, so things have certainly been sh- have shaken up since uh, in, in the last few years. Um, and I suppose for me, kind of navigating the, the, the health sector uh, and where I felt I could add the most value. Um, So a number of things have happened in in, in my life. My sister passed away Mm -hmm. in 2016 from cancer. And and that there was a huge amount of of difficulty dealing with her death, dealing with the, the lack of ability to control the situation, you know, feeling as if, don't worry, sis, we've we've got this um and recognizing that there are times that you you can't no matter what knowledge you have no matter what experiences you have no matter who you know you may not be able to to help those that you care for so so coming out of that i became even more passionate about looking at the evidence base around helping people with health challenges um expanding the audience that i wanted to appeal to so rather than focusing on you know, the elite, those who have access to certain resources, those who feel as if the message of fitness appeals to them. I, I really wanted to start speaking to an audience um, that isn't isn't included in, in the conventional message around fitness. So the majority of people are physically inactive globally. That's from the very young to older adults. 
Um, there are many who have mobility issues or have disabilities or also aren't included in, the, in that health message, that public health message around become more physically active. And so Primal Play, when we first spoke, kind of paleo fitness was my bag. Mm-hmm. That was my that was my book at the time. That was my first uh, book that was published. And and I suppose in some respects, it was quite hard, quite a hardcore message. You know, yeah. shirts off, look great. Early doing doctors. incredible superhuman things. You know what I mean? <laughs> Be a caveman. Yeah. Um, um, and now my focus is much more on the joy of movement the pleasure of movement, the um, celebrating what you can actually achieve functionally, capably through movement. And that way, it's more, much more about the individual. So whatever my issues are, whatever my age, my skill level, my, you know, dealing with pain or whatever I'm dealing with in terms of improving my health, we all have superhuman ability in some way, shape, or form. And for many of us, that isn't being realized. You yeah. know? Um, and so I wanted that. I wanted that for myself. I wanted to be able to demonstrate that to my audience. And and that's been a significant shift, both personally, in terms of the me- my messaging, uh, and in terms of my offering now. So yeah, so it's been an, uh, it's been an incredible journey, many, many ups and downs. But I've kind of come through this really recognizing what's important in terms of my message, where I feel there are many others who are not speaking. We're not, we're not speaking on the same song sheet, so to speak. Uh, and, and those are the individuals that I want to, to seek out, those who are disenfranchised by what's happening in the fitness industry, those who don't feel great, who don't want to join a gym, who feel that the no pain, no gain message doesn't appeal to them. Yeah. Um, so play, enjoyment, a focus on natural movement, but in a way that feels good, you know, feels good as soon as you participate is what Primal Play is about. So yeah, that's probably a summary of of the significant shift in in how I think about movement now. And as I get older, so I, so you know, this year is a is a, a, a you know a benchmark. I don't know what to call it, but it's one of those landmark ages where you go, oh, I have to think a little bit differently about life now. Uh, so so there's a, there's a zero, um, there's a zero <laughs> at, the, at the end, and I'm kind of like, okay, wow, I'm I'm coming out of my forties. I hit the big five zero this year, and and so yeah, longevity and healthy aging is far more important to me now than say 10 years ago where I probably would be more focusing on aesthetics. You know, I want to look great. I want to look like I'm still in my twenties. You know, I want to, I want to do crazy stuff I've never been able to do before. Now my focal lens is much more on, hold on a second. I'm thinking about another 10 years when I'm 60. Yeah. I'm thinking about maintaining independence and quality of life and maintaining function physical function and cognitive function. So again, another another shift. And I suppose my audience, a lot of my audience are also, uh, you know, have that one eye on longevity mm-hmm. as well as present day health. Yeah. So it's been, it's been exciting. Yeah, it's been exciting, Abel, for sure. <laughs> it was so funny when you were just saying that, I'm just like, man, there's no way he's more than 40. There's no way. I'm like doing the math in my head. I'm like, wait, no. The, he, I, I know his backstory. He, wait, is he 50? Holy I, wow. But there's no. So uh, you violate all sorts of norms, right? The idea that you'll be 60 in 10 years and the way that you're moving now, the way that you're living now, even the way that you speak, the way you show up in the world reflects that you're going to be, I think, living a long health span. At least what you're doing now is is protecting your your vitality isn't it yes and I, I suppose it's really important to note for those who didn't listen to the first our first podcast um discussion i i had a background of poor health so i had a very sedentary lifestyle i was working in investment banking i was pretty much sitting all day poor diet physically inactive and i i was paying the price so i had pre-diabetes, I was pretty much, I was one step away from full-blown type two diagnosis. 
I had a really poor lipid profile, so I was elevated risk of cardiovascular disease. I had blood pressure through the roof. I was suffering with low back pain. I was wearing knee supports. It was mm -hmm. uncomfortable just walking, taking the stairs was uncomfortable. I'd lose, I'd basically like collapse. My knees would kind of give way mm -hmm. just walking. I know so that feeling, it's yeah. important to, for people to, to, to be aware of my, of my background, uh, um, which wasn't, I wasn't a jock. I wasn't an athlete. Mm -hmm. I was a geek. That's why I did computer science. That's why I worked in the, in the field that I did because I was great with computers. Yeah. Um, and humans weren't a part of that. I wasn't a very social being. I much preferred interacting with computers. So crazy. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, so, so having, having that very, amber warning around you are suffering from the disease of aging, whatever that is, you're, you're suffering from those in your supposed prime. That was my like, hold on a second. Really? I need to take statins. I need to take beta blockers for my blood pressure. I need to take metformin for my blood glucose. Is there anything else that I can do? And I knew that physical activity was one way of addressing some of those ailments. So I knew it would help with blood pressure. That was probably the only thing that I knew about physical activity. I was like, okay, if I get more active, I might get my blood pressure down. I may reduce some of the stress that I'm dealing with. But I also had other benefits, like my blood glucose started to normalize. So I was no longer, you know, close to type two, no longer pre-diabetic, and my blood, my blood glucose was, was optimized. Mm -hmm. um, and my lipid profile improved. So that was my first awareness of movement being like medicine. You know, that was my that was my gateway actually to improving my my health and well being. It wasn't diet. It wasn't nutrition. It was actually movement first, and and that then led to me going, okay, I need to I need to be able to fuel my physical activity, and I want to be able to be, make the be, better food decisions. So I encountered you know the world of paleo and the, and and the like, but that understanding that movement was an important part of my health journey um and then wanting to understand why you know i was like i know nothing about movement in the in the in the um, scientific sense i don't understand the underlying mechanisms i know it's good for you but i want to know why it can help to lower my blood pressure what does movement do in relation to that how can it reduce inflammation? How can it reduce the risk of chronic lifestyle disease? I had no idea. And, and so that has been another uh, development really of looking into the research, of seeking out an evidence base, of speaking about those topics in a way that is um, one that I'm passionate about, but secondly, that I can translate that science and that evidence in a way that is prescriptive so what can i do what do we need to do as humans in order to improve our health both physically emotionally socially um, cognitively what can i do with movement that will help to address some of the issues that we're, we're facing in the 21st century and um, often not discussed is this kind of pandemic of physical inactivity of sedentary living and the more you look into this you know, us being in this, I suppose we're in a in a bubble in, in, in some respects. A lot of people we know are active, have gym memberships, are are doing are doing using movement as part of their their health prescription. But the majority of individuals are not. Um, and even those who do have gym memberships may not be aware they're still living sedentary lifestyles. Right. So one interesting bit of research is around um, you know, sitting, known as the, you know, kind of the sitting disease. So several hours per day spent sitting and what you have to do in terms of physical activity to undo the harm that comes from sitting. And uh, the research tells us that you need to be doing 60 to 80 minutes per day of moderate intensity physical activity wow. to undo six to eight hours of sitting. And six to, eight, six to eight hours sounds like a lot until you factor in, you know, your commute. If you're commuting in a car to work, you know, then you're at work, then you're sitting pretty much all day. Then you come back home on your commute. Then you probably need to rest. So you're sitting, 
you know, watching whatever, whatever, you know, you're watching on TV or, 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 or whatever you're doing. So, so more and more of us are becoming sedentary. Our children are getting more screen time. They're having less access to free play and free range activities away from home. So it's becoming more and more of the norm. And our time in the gym may not be enough to, to improve our health. Um, um, so, so yes, I wanted to address that fact. Like when people say, oh, I'm really active now, you know, I go to the gym three times a week. I do my, you know, I do my, some, some weight training. I do some cardio. I'm all good. And it's like, actually that may well not be enough yeah. to, to help with disease prevention, to help with improving your physical strength and maintaining health and longevity and vitality. And we need to be doing far more. And, and if we're time pressured, we need to be making better choices around intensity um, and types of activities that we're doing in order to still meet, still meet the requirement of humans to move in a, in a way that's, which maintains good health. So my book, Animal Moves, discusses that issue of sedentary living, uh, the issues of that, um, how we are forgetting our animal needs, our primal needs in relation to movement. And the fact that the animal kingdom is a great reference. If we look at the animal kingdom and, and move like the animals we are and, and use the animal kingdom as a reference, it's amazing what we can what we can do, how we can move from crawling, from climbing, jumping. And, and it's an expression of youthfulness and vitality, as you mentioned earlier. So you look at young children and they just have this zest for life, this energy, this curiosity. And a lot of that curiosity involves movement. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, yeah. it, it involves looking at the world around them and deciding how they can interact with the world around them. Um, and other animals, they don't just switch off when, once they become adults. You know, big right. cats don't go, oh, I've got no time for play. I've got no time for vigorous, expressive movement anymore because I'm now a big cat and I'm just going to sit here swatting flies all day. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, a big cat is more powerful, more expressive, more capable of movement than the young. But for many humans, we peak. Some of us peak before our teenage years even, right. you know, or we might peak in our teens or maybe in our early 20s. And then we, there's that decline. Um, and actually, we should be maintaining, well, not, not maintaining, maintenance is probably the wrong word. We should be increasing our capability, I believe, well into our, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s. You know, I can't say any later than that because I'm not there yet. But, yeah. <laughs> but I, I think there's a lot that we can maintain over a wide, uh, diverse range of activities. Yeah. Um, and I remember when I was 30, thinking, this is it. I'm, you know, I'm, it's downhill from here. Yeah. You know, I, I'm already feeling weaker. I'm in pain. I, I need to be, I'm being prescribed with, with medication, you know, of all of these issues that are, they're obviously genetic. There's nothing I can do about them. Yeah. And of course there's lots we can do, uh, without medication to maintain, main good, to maintain good health. And I suppose I don't want to be, um, I don't want to be ignorant of the fact that things can go wrong. Sure. But I just want to be in the best possible place I can be. So if I do suffer from whatever particular ailment that in the future, at least I'll be in a stronger position. Yeah. At least I'll be more prepared, more resilient, more robust, um, rather than deciding 20 years ago that, this was it, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing I can do to support my health apart from popping a, a, a pill or two. Yeah. So, yeah. So movement, I do believe is medicine. I do believe it's the poor cousin of, of the health, you know, um, <laughs> You're right. Health, can can I dig into that a little bit? Because yeah, I wanted to course. ask you about this specifically, because you come from, yeah. to some degree, your first, your first career was a prestigious one, as was mine, as I was paying off loans, you know, invest in investment banking, consulting, you're kind of ushered into these things. And then they're just like, you better not get out of here because you're going to be VP soon, you're going to be making <laughs> big bucks and it's all yes. prestigious. Whereas 
on the other side of things, it's like physical education teachers, at least in the U.S., are low in the totem pole, right? Oh. They're, they're at kind of bottom of the barrel for no apparent yes. reason. So what's that about? Is it similar in the U.K.? It's certainly similar in the U.K. So, I mean, of course, teaching teaching as a profession, you know, is, is certainly not recognized uh, in, in terms of financial value, in terms of salaries being paid, that's for sure, even though we know deep down how important it is, how important education is. And then I think physical education is like probably the bottom rung of that of that ladder. Um, um, and it's it's being squeezed out of curriculum, school curri- curriculums. It's being squeezed out. It's being pushed out to extracurricular activities. And you want to do physical stuff, you do it in your own time. Um, um, parents are deciding, let's not have our children have the type of childhoods that we had. So I had a childhood which was literally get out of the house. I don't want to see you until the sun comes down. Yeah. You know, get out, amuse yourself. Don't get into any trouble <laughs> and get back when we say, tell you to get back. Yeah. That was my, that was a great, that was the majority of my childhood was get outside, play, you know, a little bit of mischief, uh, but not too much. <laughs> um, uh, and now we have helicopter parenting. We have, you know, bulldozer parenting up is the latest expression I've heard being used now where helicopter parenting isn't enough. Let's not just spectate and make sure we're watching whatever our children are doing. We need to remove any hazards, any obstacles, wow. any conflict. We need to basically take, make sure that our children don't have to make any decisions which are difficult yeah. or, 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 um, or, you know, where they're challenged by having to be told no. This isn't possible. Let's enable everything for our children because I didn't have that that childhood. I want to make life a lot easier for for my children. Uh, and so there are Not so many children though. now who are suffering. Yeah, exactly. I mean, of course, we know we know the reality, right? The real life is about disappointment, is about hardship, is about navigating difficult situations and adversity. It can be hostile. You know, even in the yeah, best exactly. of circumstances, it can be hostile or go sideways. Yes. And and yes. I feel like as as the years have gone on, even I'm blindsided all the time by just getting of steamrolled course. by life. And uh, yes. if if that doesn't happen to you a few times when when you're younger, how are you possibly going to be prepared for that? Well, you know, we know that our children, you know, the the current generation of children are the most depressed anxious, uh, you know, greatest instances of self-harm, bullying. I mean, pretty much all of the worst situations that can occur in childhood, yeah. our children are, are, are facing and experiencing at a far greater rate than ever before, childhood suicides. I mean, I mean, you, whatever metric you want to use, whatever, however you want to compare ch- the children of today, in comparison to other generations, yeah. considering other generations lived through world wars and famines, I mean, you know, ch- child labor. I mean, you know, let's not paint a rosy romantic picture of the past. Sure. It, it wasn't all. It wasn't all great, you know. Um, but there were certain aspects of childhood which have been diminished to the point where children are being forced to live these very sheltered lives. Um, probably the most important currency for children being play has been, you know, a lot of children are bankrupt pretty much. That's, that's how I, that's the only way I can term it. Play has been so engineered out of their lives. Now it's Um, in social media and video games. Exactly. That takes up that time. Video games, um, structured play. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, that becomes the, no, I do let my children play because I have play dates. I do let them play because I take them to play soccer two hours on a Saturday morning. You know, they, they are, they're doing so many activities that I didn't do as a kid because now they can do ballet, then they can do some hip hop dancing, then they can do, you know, g- gymnastics, then they can do, there's all these activities that they can take part in. But again, if you look at this, if you look at the research, here's, here's another fascinating bit of research. Two hours of a structured activity, say like soccer, when children are actually monitored wearing accelerometers to see how much physical activity they're doing that's beneficial to them in terms of quantity, it's like 15, 20 minutes in a two-hour yeah. period yep. because most of the time they're being instructed, 
They're being told, watch what somebody else is doing. Now it's your turn for 20 seconds. Then you sit down and wait for somebody else to do to do their drill. And then maybe at the end, they may have a bit of time to play. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you think as a parent, oh, I'm getting, my son's getting two hours. My daughter's getting two hours of movement on Saturday morning. Actually, no, they're getting very little time. And, and again, adults are the focal point. You know, um, adults are making the decisions as to what children are engaging in. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure you can remember yourself. I certainly can remember the most fun activities as a child involve you making your own decisions, usually involve risky types of play. Yep. Um, usually multiple age groups, you know, your, your peers are, are of all different ages. Uh, and your your problem solving, your risk assessing, your learning again, you're learning about the world around around you. There's conflict that has to be resolved because if you don't resolve it, you're not going to play. You know, <laughs> you, you fall out with your mates one day, then your best friends the next. There were all these things that happen. Whereas now it's like, no, 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 let's not have any conflict. Let's not have anyone falling out. Let's make sure the rules are set by us because we we're the parents. We we know best always. Yeah. And, and our children are, there was, again, lots of studies as, as to the, the harmful impact of inte- um, emotional intelligence and social intelligence and social awareness, which can only come, which can only be developed by a child acting on their own initiative, basically. That's, that's really the crux of the, of the matter. Yes. Um, they have to be involved in making those type of decisions as to what they do what they enjoy doing um and i and this kind of play psychology when i started looking into this i was like oh play's fun hey skipping through the hay you know <laughs> let's just have fun doing exercise yeah but but actually when i think about it we did some pretty hardcore stuff as a kid yeah you know climbing trees jumping i mean we would jump off like you know, one story buildings, you know, like, yeah, I mean, I fell off inc- one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, piggyback carrying like on our bikes for miles and miles and miles. And then, and then praying we'd get back on time, you know, praying that we'd actually find our way home. There's no GPS. There were no, you know, we, right. we didn't have maps telling us where we were. It was just like, we need to get back before mom or dad finds out that we're right on the other part of the sea, you know? Um, so there was so much of that experience, which I now appreciate mm-hmm. for its kind of explorative nature, the curiosity. Should we go down that ravine? Should we cross that? Should we go into that garden? Oh, there's apples in that tree. You know, um, are we going to climb the fence and shake the tree? And, you know, what if we get caught? What if the neighbors see us? What if, you know, the, the, there's how what are our boundaries you know if adults do see us and our parents get told what we've been up to you know so there's all of these there are all these situations that we had to navigate that would help us become more resilient yeah and when you consider that children are three times more likely to get admitted to hospital falling out of bed than out of a tree compared to a generation ago that's i mean that's what i'm talking about yeah. It is shocking that the physical literacy of our children mean that they you know less rough and tumble play. You know they they don't know how to jump and land. They don't know how to fall because they don't play those type of games. Yeah. You know that that again many of us would play. I our, my bedroom. I just shared a bedroom with my brother. That bedroom. One week it was one day it was a wrestling rink. <laughs> We would climb the wardrobe. Sometimes it'd be like a, you know, we were mountaineering. We'd yeah. climb the wardrobe. <laughs> Sometimes we'd drop, jump off, pile drive. I mean, it's pretty shocking when I think about it. I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm surprised we didn't break many, many bones. But yeah, kids just we, bounce. Yeah, we just, exactly. We just did stuff which was pretty crazy. And again, we'd stop doing it as soon as the parents were around. You know, if they knew we were jumping on the bed, probably breaking the bed, <laughs> you, know, do you know, can you imagine? You know, um, but yeah, we would do some crazy, some crazy, crazy things physically. Yeah. But you just become aware of your abilities. You, you decide what you can and can't do at a given age. You know, I can't, 
I can't climb that tree now. I'm too young. I'm not strong enough. But I'll watch my peers do this. I'll learn how it's done. I'll get some help and assistance. I'll know that if I if I climb too high and I can't get down, I'm on my own. So you know. Yeah. Um, and as an adult, I think this is something which is missing from a lot of conventional fitness, actually. Yes. Um, you know, it's we're given this prescription of a lot of time keeping us within our comfort zone and getting us to do one or two or three things rather than actually going, hold on a second, there's far more to our capabilities humans than just running and lifting weights and maybe going on a bike. You know, yeah, or, it's being it's being useful. Yeah. Right? We yes, just moved exactly. our whole house again. Um the, the past few days and I was wearing my uh, my little like smart ring to track my activity and it was fascinating because when I go out for a run it's like seven or eight miles up at 8,000 feet it's like it can be pretty intense sometimes I'll do some sprints out there sometimes I'll bring the dog or whatever when I do my heavy lifts it'll be deadlifts with free weights I'll do some presses and I'll do some you know pushes pulls I've got pull-up bars and whatever but I'll usually work out for about a half an hour but during just yesterday, when I was setting up this studio, I moved it from one house to another. I'm glad everything seems to be working. I I expended more than double the energy of my eight mile run or my strength workout. I expended more than both of them put together. Oh, for sure. And, <laughs> and, and I was so shocked more. when I looked at it. It was crazy, <laughs> right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, you know what, Abel? As you can tell, folks, Abel's in sunny Colorado right now. I'm in it's London. It's getting it's, it's getting, getting dark. darker and darker. So I'm going to put I'm going to I'm going to put the lights on. I don't normally have the lights on, but I think it might be better for the audience. So what? Bear me one yeah, second. Yeah, no worries. Go for it. <laughs> hey, I can see just, you. So I wouldn't normally put these lights on for, for, for obvious reasons, but just so you can see me, I'm just not hearing a voice. But um, but yeah, I, I think you know I, I've. I remember helping my friend move house and I'm like, I relished the opportunity. I was like, yeah, I'll, you know, don't get any removal, man. Just I'll, we'll do the, we'll move the sofas and we'll do. And oh my goodness, especially when you don't know the technique. I'm used to removal men or women. know they know what they, they know how to shift big pieces of equipment. And, you know, they're like, up, we were trying to get big sofas upstairs and it's like, you know, you're taking all the strain and trust me, I, I, you feel that like you're really fit. <laughs> you just do something which is just like a hard day's bit of labor of, of, of movements that you don't normally do. Right. Trust me, my body was like, let me know that, you know, you probably need to be doing a little bit more of this sort of stuff, Daryl, because, yeah. <laughs> you know, you're, you're complaining a little bit too much. Totally. I noticed my legs. I'm just like, I don't feel this. This feel, I haven't felt this in my legs, this tired, this kind of like, it's a weird type of pain, little like dink, dink, type, yeah, yeah, like yeah, brittle yeah, yeah, yeah. pain or something when, you, <laughs> when you're just totally exhausted. And that's, that's where I was. I was so fascinated by that. Another thing I noticed is that when you're lifting weights, you're doing it with correct form, right? Even free weights, you're, you're keeping everything yes. blind. But when you're moving oh. stuff, when you're moving a sofa yes. through like a space, like that, you're on one leg and, and your knees tweaked this way and you could really rip something or blow something. Oh, you, you could. And I think this is, you know, again, this, this is another aspect of modern fitness, which is kind of missing a trick. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, this focus on the correct form and most natural movement is never symmetrical, never evenly balanced, not, you know, evenly distributed, you know, weight distribution. It's awkward, awkward angles, awkward body positions, um, compromised, you know, joints are compromised. You, you're not stable. And, and so when we're training, of course, we have to focus on form because we don't want to get injured. We want to be able to improve our performance and 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 make sure we're doing things correctly. But as soon as we move functionally in the real world, no wonder many of us are getting injured. Because as soon as we shift outside of that very structured, safe, everything is in alignment way, 
we're so weak because we don't we never train that way it's like we sheltered train fitness the, right it, it's, it's like what we were exactly, talking about before it's exactly it's exactly right so i think it's important to model some of our training some of our fitness needs to model real world scenarios mm -hmm. um and you know functional training isn't you know like standing on one leg on a BOSU ball doing some shoulder presses, you know, that, that doesn't replicate the real world. Uh, it's not often I stand on one leg <laughs> to, to perform something uh, very functional. You know, I did when I was moving, I can say. <laughs> yeah, you, you do, but I mean, but again, you, you know, you, you're, um, everything about that scenario is, uh, is a very um, unique scenario and situation. You know, you're not doing that on a regular on a regular basis. Yeah. You certainly weren't. If you're on one leg, you wouldn't be on a BOSU ball. You'd be on a stable surface when that happens. Yep. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so I spoke. Yeah. So of course, we you, we have two legs. You're going to be on one leg or the other at a certain point. But in terms of exercises that we're given, you know, stand on one leg, knee height. You know, squat on a BOSU ball. You know, work your core as you're trying to stabilize yourself. And it's like, well, how much of that will be useful to me? when I'm moving home or when I'm doing another physical activity that is useful for me, that is actually practical for me to do. Right. So I'm not knocking somebody who wants to balance on the boaster ball with one leg but and, and, and shoulder press, but I think there is more useful practical movements that are more likely to reduce injury, to will improve functional capability. And it reminds me very much of the training montage in Rocky IV, say. You know, mm -hmm. Ivan Drago, like using the best of tech or right. isolation movements, like all sexy stuff. Then you had Rocky, you know, chopping logs and chasing chickens, moving boulders and chasing chickens <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> shifting cars that are caught in the snow and stuff. And, and you know, I watched that as a that, that movie as a teenager. And I'm like, yeah. I didn't really understand. I, I thought it was just about old versus new you know and right and actually no it's it's actually about what humans have been doing for hundreds of thousands of years if you believe in evolution at least two hundred and fifty thousand years of homo sapiens have been moving that way mm -hmm. and relatively recently we have created this concept of exercise which is only here because we have less physical activity available to us through our day-to-day -day lives. We don't need manual labor. We don't need to source our food physically. It, it comes to us. We don't need to build our shelters anymore. All the stuff we used to have to do, we no longer need. So exercise is a good supplement. It's like, hey, here's something you can do to try to fill that gap, but it isn't ever going to be as good as the real stuff, like you moving home. Yeah. No, no, nothing you do in the gym would ever, ever replicate that type of work. But we need to get as close to that as possible. We need to model that as closely as possible. And so with primal play, that's what the primal part of primal play is about. Trying to have a system of movement which does acknowledge the push, the pull, the lunging, the squatting, the climbing, these all of these different movement patterns that we should be engaging in, the very slow steady motions right through to the most vigorous and powerful of activities. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to be, um, you know, it's like, I suppose it's like water. You know, if you look at, if you look at water that's moving, sometimes it's very still. I mean, you've got to look at it for a lo quite a while before you realize, oh, actually there's some movement there. It isn't as still as it looks, but then you can have the most vigorous and violent <laughs> of movement that comes from water. And we, we operate on that spectrum as well. You know, we should be able to move very gracefully, very slowly, very controlled, not mm -hmm. make a sound, very measured movements, but I should be able to sprint. You know, I should be able to climb. I should be able to jump and land and, and feel comfortable in, in doing that. I should be able to lift and carry, you know, not just lift and put it back down. You know, lifting is actually, is the precursor to taking something somewhere, even, I mean, even, even then I'm thinking about, hold on a second. Yeah. All the lifting I've done in the gym, most of it is lift. Oh, this looks good. Feels good. Right. <laughs> Straight back down. Pop it back down. And even sometimes, I, you know, most of the time, actually, I wouldn't even put it down. It'd be like, drop the weight. It's so heavy. Right. Yeah. I, I could, <laughs> I could only lift it up. 
I was not strong enough to be able to set it back down. Right. And, and Which so you have even, to do when you're moving house. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You got a yeah, big TV. You, you can't just drop that thing. <laughs> drop the sofa. Hours. Yeah. Drop the TV. You know. Drop the flat screen. Now it's too heavy. I can't <laughs> hold it any longer. <laughs> you know. So yeah. Even even that, that short circuiting of of you know the things that we do for fitness. You know, like another thing. You do a 10k. You know, you might do a 10k run. But then you're thinking, oh, I've got to walk back. I'm so tired. I'll, you know what I mean? I'll get an Uber back or, you know, actually, why not just run 5K and then 5K back? Mm -hmm. You know, why not have some purpose for your run? You know, rather than just thinking about that goal of, of distance, why not actually think about the purpose of running? I mean, you know, it's locomotion. I need to get somewhere in a given time. That's why I'm doing this. Uh, so, yeah, so everything becomes more mindful when you think of movement in this way, not just because you're in a dark room, listening to chill out music and, you know, burning incense and listening to Enya and, oh, now I'm in, now I'm really blissful and deep breathing. Actually, I want to be, I want to be just as focused if I was being chased by whatever. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I don't want to be panicking. I want to be like, you know what? I reckon I can make the right decision right now. I'm aware of my, my abilities i'm aware of my limitations i can manage this stress response in an appropriate fashion which means i have to be mindful i can't just run aimlessly i can't just do you know, you know what i mean like there's all these things that you feel the the fitness world tells us if you want to reduce stress if you want to become more mindful then you have to just slow things down you know uh, have like some water you know dripping in the background there's going to be there's going to be some sort of gong going off every few seconds you know hit a triangle and get into this nice nepalese blissful state and it's like yeah it's kind of easy to be you know it's easy to be chilled out when you're in the in the pool mm -hmm. do you know what i mean living like a monk yeah <laughs> but you want to feel that way when you're in the middle of mayhem you know, you yeah, want to when be your able truck to take... breaks down in the desert this summer yeah. and you've got to like <laughs> walk for miles and find water like literally happened. And yeah, when, when stuff like that happens to you, you see health as, and fitness as a responsibility as something that you need to keep up because if you don't, you might just die. And so and so all the people uh, you love, you know what I mean? When stuff goes really wrong and it does. It, it does. Yes. And, and I think that's the you know, we need to to recognize fitness for those extraordinary feats of you know like in that situation you could have just gone you know what i'm just going to stay here and hope somebody comes by to help yeah. you know they oh my didn't gosh, by the oh, way we called triple a and they never came <laughs> 24 hours they did not come that was wow. another big lesson <laughs> and again imagine you may not have been able to make a phone call right you might have been just out of signal do you know there's so many things that could have gone wrong but the fact that you're like you know what fine i'm going to call triple a but there's other things we can do about this. And part of it involves my physical fitness. And, and, and that is part of the solution. Um, and, and I think it's really important that, you know, what, I remember one of my clients uh, a few years ago and she came to one of my first group sessions and she was kind of like, you know, we were doing like fireman carries and like kind of like lifting carries and sprinting. And, and she was just like, what the heck is this? You know, I'm a mother of two kids. Yeah. Like, why am I, when am I ever going to need to do stuff like this? This is just, you know, I'm not in the military. She, you know, she really made a song and dance of it. Yeah. And, uh, and I said, oh, you know, you never know when you might need to be able to do something like this. And literally within about a month or two, she came to the class and she's like, Dow, you won't believe what happened this weekend. I'm in the hotel, several floors up, fire alarm goes. It wasn't a false alarm. My husband had a few too many jars, you know, if you know what I mean, he was yeah. on the source, yeah. passed out. I'm with the two kids. I literally tried to wake my husband up. He's like, yeah, whatever. Oh she gosh. grabbed her kids. She ran down, literally held the two kids. She ran down all these flights of stairs. Everyone else is just kind of walking or going, well, what do we do? Let's wait for the emergency services. She's like, heck no, I'm out. I'm out. 
She grabbed her kids. She handed her kids over to the hotel staff outside. She ran back up the stairs and she dragged her husband out of the bed, literally pulled him wow. to the front to the uh, the front of the hotel door. The I'm sorry, the entrance to the room, and the emergency services had arrived and were able to take him out. And she was wow. like, I, I knew I was able to do this because of the sort of training we were doing. I had no doubt that I was able to to do this. And she went, before this, I would have waited, probably mm-hmm. waited, sat in, sitting there thinking, oh, what am I going to do now? My husband can't help me. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck. Right. And she was like, no, my life potentially could be in danger. Got to protect the kids. Then I'm going to come back for hubby. And of course, when she went, when she was running back in, everyone was like, no, you've got to wait. Don't, no, don't be stupid. You know, she's like, no, I need to, I need to do this. And I was like, oh, that's such an incredible story. And, and it was the fact that she just felt that she was able to do this. And she says, you don't understand. Like when I'm dragging my husband and he's still, <laughs> he was so out of it. He was just like, uh, you know, uh, you know, didn't, he wasn't he wasn't interested at all. Yeah. He didn't know what was happening. Another reason she, to not be too much on the sauce, like ever. Let's just yes, say, exactly. You know, you never want to be. I mean, I don't drink anymore. I don't drink alcohol anymore. But yeah, um, I have been in. I certainly have been that smashed. Oh yeah, <laughs> um, I have too. Um, yeah. And yeah, if there ever was a real a real danger befalling you, what would you do? And oh, yeah. I mustn't forget this. So I, one of the things that I, that I, I probably didn't share back then, um, but I was actually a victim of the London bombings in 2005. So really? there were, yeah, yeah, I yeah, was yeah, there yeah. in London at the same oh, time. So, so Edgware Road tube station, metro station yeah. was one of the stations that was, uh, there was a bomb and I was basically an adjacent carriage away from the explosion. So oh it was, it was basically, I'm going to die now. It was that, yeah. that sort of moment of like, oh my goodness, my life, my life's over. Um, and it was a very difficult, very difficult to deal with. I, I spent the next nine months commuting to work on a bike because I could, I was like, I can't go in the underground. I can't go in any public transport. Uh, I was pretty much petrified to do so. 12 years later, um, 13 years later, there was, you know, a recurrence of, of the terror attacks happening. So, you know, like cars, you know, what happened in Paris and then it, then it was happening in London of cars basically mounting the pavements. And so it was another kind of quite a scary, terrifying time. And I started having flashbacks basically of what happened back in 2005. Yeah. Um, sort of like P- PTSD, uh, basically. And I was like, I thought I got, I thought I dealt with that. I thought I was over it, but I ha- I wasn't. Mm-hmm. But this is what happened to me. I'm in um, South Kensington, uh, near the Natural History Museum. Okay, and there, all of a sudden, there were lots of police. There's police helicopters, huge crowds forming, and uh, I was with my partner. I'm like, I wonder what's what's happening. Let's go and have a look. We walked around the corner, and about 20, 30 armed police like in a single row telling everyone to run for their lives and they didn't just say run for your lives they you know all the expletives you can imagine were used 90 percent of people didn't move wow you know uh as you know we don't really have armed police in london you know armed police are, are rare right so seeing that many armed police that's already like Okay, need to get the heck out of here. One. Right. <laughs> Two, that they're telling us there's been an attack, a terror attack. Get the heck out of here. Ninety percent of people just like literally froze or took their phones out to video what may or may not been happening. Oh my, God. my partner froze. She was like, I don't know what to do. And I was like, take your heels off. <laughs> like, if I need to pick you up and you know, we're, we're, we're going, we're gone, we're sprinting, we're getting out of here. Yeah. So we sprinted away. The amount of people we told as we were running past them not to go in that direction, people just like, oh, there's a terror attack. Okay, well, that just sounds interesting. It was just wow. surreal. Yeah. People just have no idea how to deal with life-threatening situations like that. I mean, it yeah. was just... 
it was just incredible. Isn't it we bizarre? Ran to the, uh, it's, um, listen, you, uh, it was just horrendous. And we ran to the tube station. So I said to her, look, let's, we're going to run to the tube station and we're just going to get out of here. So we ran to the tube station and then they said, oh, there's actually a bomb in the station. So they were closing the station down. And I was like, oh my goodness, is this happening again? But it, the good thing was I was so um, calculated about avoiding danger about protecting my partner, about getting out of here, about trying to help others in that situation. But most people were just wandering around aimlessly. Fortunately, it was a false alarm. The, the, basically, the cab driver, it was a cab dri Uber driver who had a heart attack at the wheel and mounted the pavement and, and, and unfortunately hit a few people. And he was of Middle Eastern descent, so they assumed it was a terror attack. Oh, jeez. But, but it wasn't a terror attack. But... Um, but yeah, that, you know, what happened to me the first time in 2005 just got me into, okay, I, what can we do to, to feel better about this? And it certainly wasn't getting out my phone to put it on social media no. or to document. I, honestly, it was, you, you were the, it was so surreal. It's like, in, you know, have you ever watched, um, what's that film where they, um, oh, What's that? Um, it was this Westworld. Have you ever seen Westworld? Yeah. Okay. You know how they they can turn the robots so they can kind of they freeze and, mm -hmm. and then the humans kind of keep moving. It was almost like that. Everyone just kind of froze. Like, oh, let's just film this. Let's just decide what to do next. Yeah. And we were just going like crazy, running and trying to get away. Uh, and it was like really yeah fight or flight is not the correct term for what happens there i've read a few books about it in the times of my life when it, when you know stuff is really going down big time you expect that everyone will have it together and run in the correct direction but what actually happens is 70 to 90 percent of of people like you said it's not fight or flight it's just yeah. stand there and act like everything's still okay or act like nothing's happening or just like keep doing the dishes or like yeah, someone close yeah. to me got shot and the person kept doing the dishes. You know, yeah, it, like, wow. it, it becomes your your brain and your emotions. If you're not ready just to snap into that, that mode like you did. Yes. Most people are discombobulated and they don't know what to do. So you need to somehow prepare for this. Yes, exactly. And, and I think that's the freeze, you know, the, the, the third F yeah. is the freeze response. The so, of course, sometimes freezing is appropriate, you know, like rattlesnake or, right. you know, certain dangers where, like, if you move, it's game over. Right. right? So, so, you, so again, it's, it's the appropriateness of the response. Sometimes freezing is the best thing to do. Mm -hmm. But in that situation, it certainly wasn't. You couldn't fight in that situation flight was the most appropriate yeah. i think there's another in the correct direction uh, and in the correct direction <laughs> that's, yeah. that's another thing so some too. people were, yeah some people were flying <laughs> flight was towards the danger right like i just told you there's a terror attack you have no idea what is what is happening 50 meters away from where i am right there is mayhem that should tell you i'm not interested in what's happening 50 meters away, I'm going in the opposite direction as fast as I can. Uh, oh, it was, you know, but the, the, the good thing is, and of course, you never know what, what may happen to you in terms of preparedness for, for life. But I'm thankful that I was able to run, to keep running, yeah. to be able to initially sprint, you know, like to think to myself, help others you know, who are freezing. I too. can help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't like, listen, if you those heels can go you can get it you know like if they need to if you need to throw those heels away <laughs> like so you can run bare you, do you know what i mean like right we, we don't need training shoes now we don't have time to warm up we don't have time to stretch let's just bolt let's go let's disappear uh, um and i was like yeah if i need to carry you I, that's what's gonna happen doesn't matter you know if i'm if yeah as long as we're moving away from here as long as we're you know um <laughs> not the slowest of the, of the masses, <laughs> right. we've got to, you know, we're improving our chances every second that we're taking evasive action. So yeah, it, it's, 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 um, I think it's really important for us to recognize why movement was a part of, of our heritage, 
and and why it's significantly important and why even though it isn't always as sexy as some of the other interventions mm -hmm. that we can that we are attracted to um and I, and i think part of the reason is because you know like say nutrition right if you want to improve your nutrition you can engage with a nutritionist you could get a chef right you could get somebody to pre prepare the meals for you. You could probably even pay someone to feed you. I mean, if you had the ability, you could literally get somebody to give you the perfect nutritional plan and you only had to chew. And even then you probably don't have to chew, just get somebody to, to blend it and have, a, <laughs> have it as a smoothie, right? Or have it intravenous if you really wanted to go, don't have any effort. Yeah. So you could literally have no effort, improve your nutritional uh, regimen. You know, I want to go to sleep. I want to improve my sleep. You know, you can take supplements. You can do like, there's stuff you can do. You can get hypnotized. You can get, there's things you can do to help. With movement, the only thing you can do is do it yourself. <laughs> you know, you can't, you can't outsource, you know, the effort, the physical effort required. You have to do that work. You get a PT, they can tell you what to do, but you have to do it. And I think that's why it's difficult for humans to have a, a, you know, a long term love affair with exercise. Yeah. If you can't motivate yourself, if you don't, if you don't set goals, if you, if you feel that there's always something more important to do, we, we struggle. 50% of people who sign up to gyms don't actually attend one, one session. Um, gym owners do really well. You know, the chains do really well. They sign you up for a year contract. They promise you the world, um, but you've got to attend. So I'm sure you've seen the meme, you know, um, I'm going to go to the gym next week and find out why, <laughs> find out why this gym, you know, this program, fitness program isn't working. And it's their first, it's basically the first visit, right? So <laughs> they're complaining, the gym's not working for me. You know, I haven't been there for nine months, but you know, <laughs> I need to find out why. Uh, maybe I should actually go. Uh, but <laughs> a good illustration but, <laughs> about it actually works. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I can't I'll believe it, but we're, we're almost out of time, Daryl. Before we go, can you please tell folks um, about your Animal Moves book and uh, your cards and all the other cool stuff you're working on. Yeah, so so Animal Moves really talks about how you can have a better relationship with movement, moving like the animals we are. Um, the volume, the intensity, the frequency of movement, the type of movement patterns you should be engaging in. And there's a 28 day program for intermediate beginners and advanced that takes you through the movement patterns that make you perform better, feel better um, and move better. And then the Animal Moves deck, so I've, I've got, actually I'll show this. This is the office-based version. So I have one for children, for adults, uh, an office version, um, and one for fitness professionals. And it just takes that concept of the structure that comes from the book into a way that randomizes your workouts or as I term them, playouts. Yeah. So it's just a way to kind of make it even more fun. You've got a couple of moments free to have a movement snack or movement break. So it, it just um, takes you away from tech. It's like analog gaming. Uh, it's something you can do socially. So this animal moves concept from the book has now sort of developed into into more of a, a brand in relation to to these additional additional products. So Animal Moves book you can access at animalmovesbook.com and the Animal Moves deck is at animal animalmovesdeck.com. And in terms of my philosophy and approach around the Primal Play method, primalplay.com has lots of research, has lots of um, activities has lots of uh, ideas that can help to motivate you if you're thinking that you're struggling with with having a love affair a long-term love affair that is beneficial and fruitful that's what the website has been has been developed for to provide that sort of help and, and guidance and um there was something else i was going to mention but yes oh yes <laughs> the, probably the, the final thing i should mention is i also do have a, a free ebook called the importance of play so if you go to primaplay.com forward slash ebook then you can you can access that and it just gives i mean most of us know why play is important but if you do want to geek out on some of the science if you do want some ideas of how you can enjoy um be a bit more playful and more engaging when it comes to movement that's what that ebook is about right on and we all need to play a little bit more 
Daryl, I appreciate your work so much. Thank you for getting out there and continuing to do such great stuff. We love you, man. Cheers, Abel. Keep doing no, it. No, it's been it's been superb. Thanks very much for for the time once again. Have a great day, mate. This episode is brought to you by listeners like you and Future Greens. You may know that I'm not a big fan of most supplements. It's hard to know if you're getting what you paid for. And even worse, many supplements, juices, powders, and greens we've tried taste terrible. For example, have you ever noticed that most powdered vegetable mixes taste like fish tank? Don't even mention fish oil supplements. Once you've had fish burps, it's hard to trust that brand again. So that's why Allison and I have spent the last three plus years creating wild superfoods. And it's our goal to give you the very best nutrition the world has to offer. Now you can get the concentrated nutrition of 15 organic fruits and vegetables plus six other superfoods in one extremely convenient ready-to-go package. We call it Future Greens. And if you're looking to improve your health, performance, and well-being by doubling your intake of fruits and veggies without the sugar and carbs, you're going to love it. With Future Greens, you can whip up your daily green drink in less than 30 seconds, no matter where you are. The certified organic stevia gives it a subtle sweetness and it tastes great in water or juice, and we think it even makes our green smoothies taste a whole lot better. It's made with certified organic, non-GMO fruits and vegetables to aid in detoxification, balance your body's pH, and give you a boost of clean energy without sugar, caffeine, or the dreaded crash. No junk or artificial sweeteners, and just one gram of sugar per serving. With the tasty wild berry flavor, you and your kids won't even realize you're eating broccoli and 20 plus powerhouse fruits, veggies, and adaptogens. So if you want to try our brand new creation from Wild Superfoods called Future Greens, we have even better news for you. As a listener of Fat Burning Man, and it's proof that you are because you're listening right now, you can actually get a 20% discount to try Future Greens yourself. Just visit fatburningman.com forward slash greens to get 20% off when you select subscribe and save. Once again, just visit fatburningman.com slash greens to check out Future Greens and get your special listener deal. We'll see you there. Well, hey there, listener. This is Abel one more time, and I just want to say thank you for listening to this episode of the Fat Burning Man Show. If you liked it, don't forget to hit that subscribe button wherever you might be listening to or watching this show right now. And if you have a second, please leave me a quick review for the Fat Burning Man Show. I read every single one of them, and every time you leave a review, it gives us a little boost in the rankings, and that helps other people find this show. And if you can think of someone else who might enjoy and benefit from this free show, please take a second to share it with a friend or a family member. And if they're like, what is this fat burning man thing? That's a really silly name. You could be like, you're right, but here's the deal. We've recorded over 250 episodes of the Fat Burning Man Show with thought leaders in health from all over the world. And so far, We've won four awards, hitting number one in health in more than eight countries internationally. We have more than 30 million downloads already, but we're just getting started. I can't believe any of this, by the way, and, and couldn't do any of this without you. So thanks once again. But here's some more good news. You can download and listen to every single episode of the Fat Burning Man Show for free with zero outside advertisements, no outside sponsors and no corporate overlords. All you have to do is type in fatburningman.com. We'll give you a, a second here just to type it in, fatburningman.com. And you'll get all the show notes, transcripts, and video and audio versions for all the past episodes of the Fat Burning Man Show for free. Better yet, enter your email at fatburningman.com, sign up for my newsletter, and I'll even send you a quick start guide so you can take your health into your own hands right now, along with a few of our ridiculously tasty recipes as a special thanks for signing up. Once again, just go to fatburningman.com right now, enter your best email to get your free goodies with a bonus surprise straight to your inbox. This is Abel James signing off. Thank you so much for listening once again and have a great week.